This is screencast chapters 6, 7, and 8, part 3. We last left off with the cave drawings in the Lascaux Cave. The Lascaux Cave is an underground cave in France that um, explorers found about 300 images of various animals and even the outlines of human hands. Now, a different surface or one of the materials that an artist uses, of course, is paper. Papyrus is um, a paper-like material that is made from pressed plant stems. And here you can see that's what the Egyptians used. Papyrus actually comes from the plant that you see here on the left, um, the papyrus plant. Uh, the reed is the actual portion that they use. The top fan-shaped fronds were actually used for perfumes but the reed is actually in the shape of a triangle or a pyramid. Um, the video link there should take you to a video that um, will show you how the paper is actually made. Then of course paper, uh, machine-made paper came about in 1799, so there's a date that you'll probably need to know for the exam. Uh, the first patented uh, paper making machine was made by a man named Nicholas Roberts. So there's another name that you will probably need to know for your exam. Wood pulp is considered to be the most important ingredient in paper making. Now generally when you think of paper, you think of it coming in um, how many sheets. So you buy a um, 300 sheets of paper, which actually what you're doing is you're buying it in weight. Okay, it does come in various surfaces. We've talked about that, smooth to rough. Um, you can also see a video link there that will take you to a video watching um, traditional paper making um, with a mill, um, water mill making and beating the paper. Now, the prominence of painting, so painting. Um, the reason for the prominence of painting is usually because it's in full color and it's usually already framed. Um, the materials does cost more, but because of it having a prestige to it, some of the other arts like drawing kind of take a second class status. Um, painting is considered to be the queen of the arts. There is no king, so remember that painting is the queen of the arts. So here are some painting terms that you will need to know for the exam. Um, pigment, it is the color element um, in the paint. It usually comes from some sort of paste or some form of powder, um, let's say. Medium or binder, it is the substance in which the pigment is suspended. And then solvent or vehicle, this enables the artist to thin down the paint to control its flow and also to clean the brushes, which of course depends upon whether it is a water-based paint or it is an oil-based paint. So water would be the solvent for a water base. Oil-based paint would be something like a turpentine, thinner, mineral spirit, something along those lines. Now support is any surface that the artist may work on, canvas paper, plaster, flesh, whatever that support is. Now ground and primer is the preliminary coating on the support. It makes it more receptive to the paint and or to create certain effects. So think of it if you've ever painted in your home, normally you have to prime the walls before you put on the paint. So that's going to help that paint adhere to it. Now encaustic is a type of painting and the encaustic um, word comes from the Greek word of burning in. It was considered to be the first type of painting that was widespread and well perfected technique and what it does is it takes pigment particles and suspends it in hot beeswax. So there is a luminous quality to it. This particular piece that you see on the left actually has some gold leafing in between some of those layers of uh, wax. Page 159, figure 7, 1, and 7, 2 are examples of some encaustic paintings. Now here you can see how the encaustic is done. That blue block the artist holds in their left hand there is the pigment that is in the wax. They're taking it on what basically, if you see there on the right, it's sort of like a hot plate and a metal surface to where the paper is laid on that. So it's a hot surface so they can push and pull that around with that paintbrush. 
Now, what is a fresco? A fresco is when the artist paints water suspended pigment on a surface of freshly spread wet plaster. As the plaster dries, the colors are absorbed into it so that the two fuse together. And this is actually called a bueno fresco or true fresco. So wet on wet is bueno fresco, a true fresco. Now this is considered to be a wall painting technique since plaster is very brittle when not put onto some sort of support like a wall. Plus it's very heavy. Um, it can only be worked when the plaster is wet. So if the plaster dries, the artist actually has to come in, chip off that area, respread wet plaster, and paint all of it again. Now Michelangelo um, could cover about one square yard a day in painting a fresco. And that's what the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is, is a fresco. Now again, to correct mistakes or change something, the plaster has to dry and then be chipped away and the wet plaster then spread again. Um, how this actually is done is they would spread the wet plaster and then would have um, what is called a cartoon or a fresco cartoon. This is where the preliminary drawing is on on paper and that has holes poked through to allow charcoal dust to pass through and transfer the drawing to the wet plaster. Um, plaster can be painted when it is dry, um, in which case the technique is referred to as fresco secco, so dry fresco. This is where the paint sits on the surface. There's no fusing of the plaster and the paint. So this is where you would have that paint where it kind of dries and chips and falls away. You will need to know bueno fresco and fresco secco for the exam. Now there are three great eras of fresco painting, so here's a listing. There's classical, renaissance, and early 20th century Mexico. Renaissance is the one that you're going to be more familiar with, the, the paintings by Michelangelo, Raphael, those types of paintings. Now egg tempera, this is paint pigment is suspended in different vehicles such as egg yolk, milk, fat, wax, or resin. Um, it dries really quickly. Um, and retains its brilliance and clarity for centuries. So those are some really good things, but also if, if an artist works slowly, drying fast is not a good thing. Now oils. Oil paint um, is thought to have been invented and used in early 15th century by the artist Jan van Eyck. Um, this is a self-portrait of Jan van Eyck on the left. Um, looks a little bit like Professor Quarrel from Harry Potter. And um, Jan van Eyck, if you remember the name, Jan van Eyck painted the Arnolfini wedding. Now, this takes pigment that is compounded with oil, usually some sort of linseed oil. Now, this particular painting medium dries slowly. Um, it can be applied in different ways. Um, impasto is a thick application of paint. So if you've ever walked up to a painting and it has chunks of paint, that's actually called impasto. Now glazes is another technique where the oils are diluted and then applied in thin layers. And then there's also called what is a la prima. And a la prima is a spontaneous painting that's done traditionally on a white ground. I don't teach my students to do it on a white ground. It just seems like you have all the other values in between. So we usually start on some sort of medium ground. But it's generally a fast, spontaneous painting. Artist gives themselves a time limit. There's usually no drawing involved. It's going directly in with paint. Now, watercolor. This is pigments that are suspended in gum arabic, which is a sticky plant substance, and then thinned with water. It is applied transparently and in washes. So here upon the bridge and the top of the horse's head and nose, all of that being white like highlight, the artist doesn't use white paint. They actually just leave the white of the page. Now, mistakes cannot easily be corrected with this material also. Page 166, figure 7, 9, you'll see an example of a watercolor in your text. There's also um, a video clip here. Um, I believe it should be of paint being made. I wouldn't suggest watching the whole thing. It's just one of those that it's interesting to see how paint is made. 
Now, a gouache is when opaque white is added to watercolors. It gives it kind of a chalky, flat color to it. So white added to watercolor is actually called gouache. Page 167, figure 710 is an example of a gouache painting in your text. Now, acrylics, this is a synthetic media that is strong, quick drying, weatherproof, and fade proof that was introduced back in the 1950s and can even be thinned down with water and shot through an airbrush. It can be applied to almost any support. Um, page 169, figure 712 in your text, you'll find an example of an acrylic painting. Now collage is stuck in this area because it's really not kind of an area to stick it, but um, collage is a French word that means pasting or gluing. It's the practice of attaching objects such as bits of paper or cloth or some sort of surface to a support to make a pictorial image. Um, you've all done a collage, it's just whether you've done something that's like a fine art collage where it generally has some sort of narrative or story to it. Page, uh, or this video link is I highly suggest watching. This is an artist who actually does collage work out of money. Now, mosaics is very similar to collage. This is assembling small colored stones, bits of glass or clay tiles into a pattern or a pictorial image. These are examples of some um, mosaics that are on the inside of Cinderella's castle at Disney World. So here you can see pretty good examples. Um, uh, next we have printmaking section. Um, prints differ from most other work in that they are made by what we call an indirect process. Now you will need to know that on your exam. The artist does not draw or paint directly on the work of art, but instead creates the surface that makes the work of art. So in other words, the printing plate versus the print that is pulled from the plate. Now the printing process results in many nearly identical images, which is why it is called the art of multiples. You will need to know that for the exam. This makes art available to anyone. So in other words, if you have posters, you have prints. Now printmaking procedures. The artist works on a plate or stone or some other surface to make the image. Then the image is printed on paper by hand or by some hand operated machine, either by the artist or someone under the artist's supervision. Now usually it is decided in advance as to how many prints will be made whether it be 10, 50, 100, 500, whatever the number is, that number of prints that are pulled is referred to as the addition. Now, hard metal um, plates will create many impressions, whereas soft materials such as linoleum wears down and doesn't produce as many impressions. Now, when the impressions are made, that plate or block is supposed to be destroyed. Why? So there are not any more made in that edition. So in other words, let's say the artist made only five in their edition, but in reality they made 500, but they're selling them as if there's only five out there in the world. So that's why that plate or block is supposed to be destroyed. Finally, the artist signs and numbers each one with the, let's say it's number 10, print out of 100 prints, so it would be 10 over 100, so you know what that addition size is and what number you have. Now there are five basic methods for making an art print. So page 179, figure 8-1 in your text, you should find um, illustrations of these. It will help you understand each of them a little bit more. Here is that listing of those five. We have relief, intaglio or intaglio, lithography, screen printing, digital inkjet. So um, I'm going to end this part and we will pick up with part four on the next section.